His mercy and His love, His kindness and His grace towards us is extended, like I said, in such abundance. He's merciful, He's kind, He's righteous, and He's true. He wants to meet your need. He wants to supply everything that you desire. He wants to supply everything that you need. That's why it says to seek ye first the kingdom of God and all His righteousness. Everything will be added. Isn't He wonderful? He merciful. My, what a testimony service. The goodness of God and His love and His grace that's bestowed on us each and every day is fantastic. It's wonderful. We ought to lift a praise to Him. It should continually be in our mouth, as David wrote there in Psalms, I believe it was. If you have your Bibles, one turn to uh, John chapter 15. This may sound a little familiar to a few. But we're going to talk about tonight faith and fruit. What God requires of us. The proof that's in the pudding, so to speak, of our lives that proves out who that we are. And why that that's the case and why we need that. <clears throat> Amen? All right. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and we'll get started. Heavenly Father, we sure appreciate your goodness and your mercy towards us. We thank you, Father, for the plan of salvation. We thank you, Father, for your wonderful word. As Father, as your uh, word goes forth, Lord, that we, having ears to hear, would pay attention and that our hearts would be prepared to receive the seed of your word on good ground. Father, that we can be fruitful for you, that we would produce fruit, Father, to be zealous of good works, to honor you in all that we say and do, and allow your Spirit to lead us and guide us in everything that's within us, with everything that we do, with every effort, Father. And we love you and we'll praise you for it and have your will, your perfect way, in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Got not a bunch of scripture, but quite a few, so I'm going to try to boogie along here. But I just want to follow the leading of the Spirit of the Lord. Amen. Main verse I want to uh, bring out, want to get stuck in your me uh, memory, is John 15 and 8. <clears throat> if you're note takers, Derek, take some notes. <laughs> Herein is my Father glorified, Jesus speaking, that you bear much fruit. And so shall you be my disciples. Not only does it prove out who we say that we are when we bear fruit, but our Heavenly Father is glorified in this. This is what Christ, this is what our Heavenly Father expects from us, is fruit to be bore in our lives. We know trees by their what? By their fruit. An apple tree can say as much as he wants to, I'm a pear tree, but he ain't ever going to be a pear tree. It's, he's proven out by the fruit that he bears, and it's the same with us. We're proven out by the fruit that we bear. Let's back up to verse 1. <clears throat> I'm sure we've all heard that. Well, I think we've all heard this quite a few times. I know I've heard this numerous times. Growing up in church and these, uh, these verses, but they're so true. I don't want to just graze over them, glaze over them, however you want to say it. Just don't want to just read them and move on, but let them... <clears throat> Saturate the Word of God. Verse 1 says, Jesus speaking, of course, I am the true vine. My father is the husbandman. Now the husbandman's job was to keep the, keep the vineyard, keep the yuck out and produce uh, uh, everything that would be productive, cultivate, water, uh, uh, do everything that's needed to, uh, to keep the vineyard at its peak performance, okay? Every branch, verse 2, in me that bears not fruit, he takes that branch away. Every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, and it may bring, that it may bring forth much fruit. And we've talked a lot about that in Sunday school class. Uh, that first half of that verse there uh, is part of why it ought to make us tremble to be in the presence of a living God. Because it's life and death situation here. Uh, listen to what he's saying. Every branch, he's speaking of you and of me, that doesn't bear fruit, he's going to take that away. 
If, if you're a little uneasy with wanting to believe that, we're going to get into a little bit more scripture here in just a little bit that's a little more severe than that and, and compounds on what he just said. But listen to the second half. Every branch that bears fruit, he purges it. Good old King James. You know what purgeth means? He prunes and gets things out of your life so that you can be more fruitful. I want you to keep in mind as we read through these verses, this is the will of God for you. Don't be as much concerned about, I'm a preacher, I'm a singer, I'm a Sunday school teacher, I'm in helps ministry, I'm in this and that and this and that. This is basics 101 for every Christian. It doesn't matter what you say your ministry is. This is what God's expecting from us so that whatever ministry you're in is fruitful in that sense. <clears throat> Read verse 2 one more time. Guys, this is for today. This is stuff we've got to get. This is stuff I've got to get to be well-pleasing to the fathers. I don't want to stand before him and say, Lord, Lord, but didn't I do these things? And my motivation was wrong. I had a form of godliness. I would praise him with my lips, but my heart was far from him. See, you cannot produce good fruit and have your uh, denying the power thereof. That don't work. Good fruits comes from a good relationship with them, okay? All right, every branch, verse 2 again, in me that beareth not fruit, he takes away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it might bring forth more fruit. If you want to be pleasing to the Lord, if, if, if verse 8's true that we read a little bit ago, herein is your fa my Father glorified that you bear much fruit, we should desire that God start taking some stuff out of our life so that pruning so that we can be more fruitful for Him. See, that's how this thing works. If we want that for the Father, if we want to honor Him, if we want to bless Him, if we want Him to be glorified, this is how this works. Verse 3, Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. The words Christ is speaking is true, and that's how the branch stays clean, through the word of God. We've got to have it. I encourage you to get at least a little daily dose of the Word of God in on a, I mean, every day. It's how we sustain. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. <clears throat> no more can ye accept ye abide in me. Just some simple basic truths. We all understand that if the, a branch is sticking out of the uh, vine here and we expect it to grow fruit, it's got to be connected to the vine. That's where it receives all its nutrition. That's where it receives everything that's going to bear that fruit and produce that fruit. It's the same with you and I and Jesus. If we walk away from Christ and if he becomes second or third priority or he's not even on the stovetop, so to speak, you're not pleasing the Father. You're not going to bear fruit. Or we can come up with a conscious fruit that, oh, we're a Christian because we check off a list of things to do, but if we're not abiding in the vine, we're missing the mark, and we're not going to be able to produce the fruit he's expecting. Verse 5, I am the vine, you're the branches. He that abides in me and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. There's a way to check yourself. If I, am I where I need to be with Christ? Right there's a real good one. That's a real good mirror to put in front of your face and say, am I a true Christian or not? Listen to what he says. I'm the vine, you're the branches. He that abides in me and I in him brings forth much fruit. Well, Eddie, what's fruit? Just hang on. We're going to get to that here in just a little bit, all right? <clears throat> For without me, you can do nothing. <laughs> well, one thing I loved about Jesus, he didn't beat around the bush. And Jesus didn't sugarcoat things. He gave the truth because truth is what brings life and makes us free. So he just says it like it is. I try my best to pattern my life that way. Yes, we need to do things out of love, but we need to just simply deal with the truth and not this getting around it kind of thing and whatever and salt's not to hurt and salt's not to do. We need to get to a place where we just deal with the truth, period. And I'll be the first to admit, dealing with the truth in my life isn't always the funnest thing and it don't always feel good, but it brings the best results. It brings change and growth. Flesh don't like that. That's why we got to kill it so it doesn't have an influence in our life. Crucify it. Six. If a man abide not in me, guys, this is where I was going, uh, so talking about a little bit ago. If a man uh, abides not in me, he's cast forth as a branch and is withered. Men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they're burned. This isn't a scare tactic. This is a truth tactic. Jesus is loving us enough to tell us if we're not going to abide in him, we're going to wind up in hell because we're worthless to him. We're fruitless to him. 
It's just the, it's just the matter of fact. It's just the, this is the truth. And he loves us enough to tell us this. Before a verse or two, he said, without me, you can't do anything. We've got to realize that. See, we need to come to a place where we're not so worried about what is it I can do for the church and realize we can't do anything without him. And then once we get that established in our lives and we need him, we desperately need him, then we can start bearing fruit for him because we're in the right place. <laughs> Has anybody ever planted something somewhere and then, oh, that wasn't the right place and you wanted to remove, you know, all those kinds of things? Sometimes we do that to God. This is where I need to be. This needs to be what I need to be doing and all this kind of nonsense. And he's got a, what do you call it when you move it? Relocate it. That's the word I was looking for. Thanks, Kurt. Just your face made me think of that. <laughs> okay, let me get serious here. Verse 6. If a man doesn't abide in me, he's cast forth. Don't listen to nonsense that says, if we accept Jesus or or claim Jesus, or whatever else, that there's nothing expected of us, and we're sealed until the day of redemption. That is a truth by the earnest, the Spirit that's given. We just covered that in Bible study. But it takes us abiding in the vine for that to happen. You cannot confess something and then not live it and expect everything to, to work out. It does not work. We must abide in Him, and He'll abide in us. He says, call on me, draw on me while I'm near. That's why. Today's the salvation. Right now is the accept time. we got to do something to keep this relationship up, else he's going to cut us off. Verse 7, If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you can ask whatever you want. It'll be done to you. Is that not... It? See, he gives us the truth. If we're not going to abide in him, it's going to be death and, 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 and damnation. But if we will abide into Him, look at the pleasures and the benefits and the love and what He's ready to bestow if we'll simply abide in Him. I love it. He's just telling us the truth. This is what is expected. See, He's not a respecter of persons. See, He doesn't love Curtis more than Dean. Or He doesn't find a higher place for Scott than Wanda. He sees us all the same. His love is to all of us the same. And he expects the same thing out of Rose as he does Jane and Curtis as Derek. And, and I mean, that, that's just how he is. And I so appreciate about him. It's so frustrating dealing with people that prefer one over another and this. And they got all this deception going on and stuff twist. That's not our God. It, and, it, and that's a fantastic thing. Verse 8, again, herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. And so shall you be my disciples. In other words, that will prove that you're my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Continue in my love. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I've spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. I really, really appreciate that. He doesn't leave any guesswork. He doesn't leave any place to question. See, he's not the author of confusion. He says, this is the truth. Receive it or not. Now, it's up to us to make up that decision. You know, we can say some, well, I don't know, just think any example. Pray that I be more faithful. Well, for the next three few weeks, it just seems like everything gets in the way. And then we credit the devil with fighting us to try to keep that from happening. And we're not dealing with our own mind to make up our own decision and to sacrifice and to be more faithful. That's just, there it is. That's the truth of it. We must keep in mind that the devil is a defeated foe. Sure, he fights. Absolutely, he does. But that doesn't guarantee victory in our lives just because, well, all that it proves when Satan has an advantage over us is that our faith is weak. Because Scripture tells us if we have the shield of faith held up, it's able to quench every fiery dart that the enemy would throw against us. That's just the truth. There it is. Take it or leave it. <clears throat> okay. Galatians chapter 5. I thank God that he is a God of variety. I, I, I don't know if I say it enough to each one of the preachers that are in here, but I really do enjoy listening to the Word of God being preached in the way that each individual preaches. It's wonderful. It's tasty. It's fabulous. It's a joy. 
It's it's awesome. <clears throat> okay. Uh, okay, we're talking about fruit being the vine. Uh, Galatians 5.22. We're about to read God's character. And this is the fruit that God expects to see from His children. Verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, it's joy, it's peace and long-suffering, it's gentleness and goodness and faith, it's meekness and it's temperance. Now, there's all kinds of different things and ways that we can define what these are, and I think we've got a pretty good grasp on it, but I want to uh, focus on a couple of them here. Love, that kind of covers all of it. We, we understand a love. And the joy that's in us, that should be produced in us as fruit. It, it should be evident in our life. It proves out who we say we are. Peace. Did you know faith and peace go hand in hand? Because when you're not uh, uh, leaning on your own understanding, but you're acknowledging Him in all your ways, there's a peace there. What's that verse, Scott? Uh, uh, Thou shalt keep Him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because He trusts in thee. That, that is one of my most favorite, favoritest favorites. I'm glad Scott got a hold of that however many years ago that was and, and kept ministering that and, and sharing that. Uh, went and listened to, a, was it a revival last week in... in uh, hilltop over there in Huntsville or Hinesville somewhere it's kind of in between the older minister and I can't remember what his name was but he was just rattling off verses one after another and it was such a delight it's like, it like sitting down to a bowl of green beans or whatever or ice cream or Brussels sprouts whatever you like I don't like to use the ice cream reference with Rose around there's something wrong with her <laughs> kind of like my mom with sour cream I don't I don't get it but anyways sour cream is good stuff Okay, just having fun. But he was rattling off verse, and that was one of the ones he brought because uh, uh, thou shalt keep him in perfect peace because his mind stayed on thee because he's trusted and he trusts in thee. Here's one I wanted to get to, long-suffering. And I know our pastor's really kind of been hammering that one. We need that. Why is it? Because it's essential for what we're going through in these last days to not get ahead of God and not start allowing uh, the temptation of doubting God because things are taking time. We need to be patient. That's why he brings that scripture out in Hebrews. After we've done the will of God, we need, have need to be patient. Wait on him. Let him work. You're not God and you're not the Holy Spirit. You do your part to have faith and trust in him and then let him perform that work. Meekness. I'm sorry, let me back up. Gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance, and the other word for temperance we know is self-control. Not flying off the handle, but keeping your cool. Allowing God to keep you at peace. All right, and then I love the, the end of this, verse 23. And against such, there is no law. Not God or man has anything against us by the word of God if these things be in us and are in abundance. That's an awesome thing. Verse 24, they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. And if we live in the Spirit, we must walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another or envying one another. I want to go back to a garden reference again. What is it if, uh, uh, well, okay. You plant your seed, you've, you've got the ground ready, you've planted the seeds, watered it, sunshine, everything's starting to come up. But what also starts coming up? weeds and you have to do what with weeds you got to get them out or they'll what they'll take over verse 26 let us not be desirous of vain glory and starting to provoke one another and envying one another it's like planting weeds in your garden it will choke what God's trying to do and the fruit that you're capable of producing out in your life when you start looking to self Vain glory. <clears throat> Been there, done that, and it's choked out a lot of good stuff that, like Curtis was saying when he was up here, all the good that could have happened. <clears throat> okay, so we've covered fruit real good. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 10. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I don't mean to be dry. I know it's a lot more entertaining to have somebody pace back and forth and get excited and passionate about it. And I get that way with some things, but 
I just want to be real, real with us tonight. I, 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 my heart's desire, Jane, is that we get this and it get down inside of us and it starts molding us and shaping us. There are gifts of the Spirit. I know we all know that. Words of wisdom, healing, supernatural faith that haven't stopped and are still available, but they're so uh, few and far between. And desire seems to be quenched by uh, focus elsewhere. If we could get in it, that desire, uh, Scripture tells us to, and that's not the message tonight, so I need to quit talking about it, but if we could get it in our hearts to desire those best gifts so that we can be a blessing and an influence and produce more fruit. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Hebrews 10, 23. <laughs> Faith. Faith is not a confession. Faith must have fruit to back it up. You remember it was talking about good works a little bit ago, or what is that fruit that we're supposed to be producing? That's what we're about to get into. These things need to be evident in our life to prove we have faith. Faith is simply a word unless there's something to back it up. And the only thing that can back it up is action. Okay? You can say, you can proclaim, and you can speak to the, and all those kinds of things, but if there's not action behind that, you, know, you can believe those things, believe, as if it was, didn't require something itself. But unless there's action behind it, uh, uh, it will profit you nothing. It will get you nowhere. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. God is faithful. He that uh, promised, He's faithful. Don't waver from that. Don't get your... Don't let the world get you down. Don't let things that's going on around you start to suck the, the faith or the life out of you, whatever, guys. We're told things are going to get worse. If you're not careful, you talk about how horrible things are getting and gas prices and politicians and all this kind of nonsense. We need to be producing a good fruit of goodness, of faith, meekness, and gentleness, and get out of the blah, 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 blah business. Follow Wanda's advice. She said just a little bit ago, I was just sitting here thinking, I'm a king's kid. That's real good advice. That's some of the best thing you can do is sit around and think about who you are in Jesus Christ and who he is for you. It'll keep your heart in the right place and your mind in the right place. So once you get on Facebook or the news or whatever else and everything and everything else is all about everything going on, it's hard to keep your smile on. It just really is. Unless you're strong in faith and trust in the Lord and not allowing that nonsense to sway you. Okay, next chapter, verse or chapter eleven. This is verse six. Why is faith impo uh, important? This is why right here. And I know we've heard this a million times probably, but we need to get it into us. Get it to where we don't forget it. Get it to where we're reminded of ourself of this. I've got to have faith or else I'm not able to please God. I've got to be of faith. I've got to trust Him. There's sacrifices I need to do. There's fruit I need to be producing. And, and here's the thing with all of it. It's not like we got to perform some act. It comes out of a love relationship with our Creator. And He starts producing that in us. And it's not something we got to crank and get worked. It really isn't. But the more you fall in love with Him, the more you yield to Him, and He is, is your God, and you're His person, you're His child, things will start meshing and working out. It really will. And you won't have to be worried about performing some duty or a checklist of do's and don'ts and all this kind of stuff. You remember the young ruler asked the guy, or asked Jesus, asked the guy, asked Jesus, what, uh, uh, what's the most important commandments? Everything required in Scripture is he, he, Jesus handles. And we know the, the answer. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. And we can't skim over that and not dig into that because once you dig into that and what that really means and what that, if you start working on that and want to produce that for the Father, He starts producing His blessings and His love and His mercy in you. You just watch what happens in your life. It's amazing. Stuff you just didn't even realize was happening that you was affecting and doing around you in a good way. It's just awesome. But if you don't, sometimes you'll start realizing that you're affecting things in a not so good way in your world of influence. Okay, let me get back on track. Verse 6. But without faith it's impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe. <laughs> 
that God is who He is. And that God is a rewarder of those that seek Him. Nope. I missed a word, didn't I? Diligently seek Him. See, if we're not careful, we'll just eke enough by so that just close enough where we don't fall off, so to speak, just enough where we can appease our conscience that we're doing what we're supposed to be doing when all well inside, we know we could be doing more. We know we should be... Uh, I love how Brother Dean brought out the 10% thing this morning with time. I think he's on to something a little more than just a hunch or however you brought that out. Of course God requires that. And that's just really a guide. My goodness, a relationship, if all I gave that woman over there was 10% of my time, and vice versa. <clears throat> Without faith, it's impossible to please him. Okay, real quick, James chapter 2. We're getting close to being done, if that helps anybody. <clears throat> I'll laugh when pastor says that. I really... I'm falling in love with the Word of God because it's, uh, it's sustaining. It's because you get all kinds of stuff from uh, places you wouldn't think to try to tear down faith and try to tear down uh, the truth. But when you can come back to the Word of God, it doesn't matter what's thrown at you. It doesn't matter the fiery dart. It doesn't matter from who or where that comes from. This is a sustaining thing. and That's why it's, it's a joy. Scripture says, How love I thy law, it's my meditation day and night. Okay, James chapter 2 and 14. But if ye have bitter envying and strife, uh, let's see, I didn't go to the right place, chapter 2. I went to the wrong chapter. I knew that didn't sound right. What does it profit, my brethren, though a man say that he has faith and have not works? Can faith save him? What James is bringing out is, if you're going to say you got faith, you must back it up with works. Faith is worthless. It's, it's, it's not tangible unless there's a work behind it. We can say, and we can say, but unless we produce, faith is just speaking into the air. Okay? What does it profit? My brethren, though a man say he has faith and have not works, can faith save him? If a brother or a sister, listen, here, here's an example. I love that about James. He's a lot like his, his half-brother Jesus here. It's wonderful. If a brother or a sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace and be warmed and be filled, and you don't give him those things which are needful for his body, what does it profit? You see, don't ask God to do things and then leave it there. Be willing to be part of the answer that you're praying to God. Primarily, and it's real close to 100%, the way God ministers to His people is through His people. We are His hands and His feet. And if you desire a blessing for somebody, and James is just using this example, doesn't mean we've got to go clothe everybody, but when you're moved on by the Spirit, let's act. That proves out your faith. If you see a need and you're, you're moved with compassion, that's the time to do something about it. It's not a compulsion thing. Be careful with that because emotions will get you in trouble. Believe you me. Okay? But if the Spirit, and that's another reason why it's so important to know the Spirit of the Lord and to know His voice. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and they know my voice. That's why it's so important when you see a need and you're moved with compassion to do something about it. You check with the Spirit inside you and then you produce some fruit with some love by providing the need or do something for somebody. That proves out your faith. And that's not to go get on Facebook and tell everybody how, what a nice and wonderful person you are. Because your reward's your reward ends right there because you've already got it. Come up here and let me pat you on the back or give you a cookie, and then that's it. I would rather lay up, lay up treasures in heaven where the moth can't eat it and the kids can't steal my cookie. <clears throat> Verse uh, 17. Even so faith. Listen, guys, this is just the truth. Even so, faith, if it does not have works, it's dead being alone. Your faith and my faith is dead 
considered dead to God if there's nothing backing it up. One of the best places you can back it up is in your daily life. Not in going and producing something, but your devotion to God. See, disciples means disciplined. Remember that first chapter we read in there in John 15? It says, herein you, you'll be my disciples by producing this fruit. It proves out who you are. You need to be doing that in your daily life, your devotion and your, your proof of your relationship with God. Once that established, your vine will start growing out. And he'll cut the little junk off, and then you'll get thicker vines, and then more fruit can be produced. That's how this thing works. <laughs> Just a couple more verses here in this chapter. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me your faith without works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. See, James is doing a little bit of play on words here, so to speak, to get you to think. If I, I, I have great faith so that I can move mountains. Well, if there's nothing to back that up and I don't produce with that, that's just a bunch of speaking into the air. James says, I'll show you my faith by my works. That's how it's proved out. Not out of your mouth, but out of works, out of fruit being produced. And don't think that it's like you got to go move some mountain and there goes Mount Olive over there or whatever. That's not what he's talking about. There'll be the love and the one of the biggest, <laughs> biggest things that'll be proved out in your life that you're producing the fruit you're supposed to be producing is you'll be able to keep your mouth shut when you want to open it. When you think about Sister Rose, it'll only be positive things and not negative. When you think about how empty the church is, you'll be willing to pray for it instead of complain about it. And we go on and on. And on. That's, see, that's good fruit starting to be produced. That's seeds and cultivation going on in the garden of our heart here so that things can happen for God instead of, well, I got to do this for God and I got to go cast some demons out and I got to uh, heal the sick and all this kind of stuff. We got to realize we're growing. Those things, absolutely, yes. And if the Spirit ministers that in us, let's get it done. But we're growing in Him on a daily basis. Okay, one more scripture. <laughs> this is in Titus 2 and 14. I wanna, I'm going to back up and read just a little bit more. Is this, this is one of the coolest chapters? This is one of the chapters that Papa used to use that was such an influence on me. <clears throat> Starting at 11. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared unto all men, not at the chosen few, but unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness, denying worldly lusts, we should live soberly, we should live righteously, and we should live godly in this present world. And while we're doing that, we're looking for that blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Now this is the verse I want to get to who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people. There's something different about them. What is it with you? Something different, peculiar. Okay. There's this next little phrase, zealous of good works. Herein is my Father glorified that you produce much fruit. Zealous of good works. You know what a zealot is? Used in the negative connotation, it's a someone just crazy passionate about something so much. You just, that, that's all they talk about. That's all they do. They're just on the positive side of the thing. All your heart desire is is to produce fruit for your God. Zealous of good works. Let's do something. You know what Jesus done when he walked around? He looked for blessings. He looked for a place where he could sow some compassion and sow some love and sow, sow some grace and some mercy. <clears throat> These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority and don't let any man despise you. We can have such a confidence in, the, in who we are as, as sister. I love how she said that. I'm just thinking, I'm a king's kid. Remind yourself of who you are. And if a guilt starts coming over because you got, you're not as fruitful as you should be, right now is the time to do something about it. 
we've got to stop treating church like it's some kind of a gathering, and then we go home, and then we'll sort it out with God. That's what this is for. When God's ministering to us, that's the time to do something about it. That's the time to get real with Him about it, however you want to say it. That's the time to speak to Him. And if there's something triggering in you as you hear a message, whether it's tonight or any other time, and God's ministering to you and drawing you, do something. Activate that faith. Because you're faithless if you're just going to sit there and the Spirit of the Lord's dealing with you and you don't do anything about it. Amen? Amen. Anybody need any prayer, special prayer or anything?